chapter 8. If you don't, it'll be on the big screen. Although I do like to see you carry your Bible to church. And I think it's a good habit to get into. In fact, I'm going to tell you, I want to tell you a story about uh, one of the things that, that uh, really revolutionized, uh, revolutionized my life at the age of 18. And it was a gentleman by the name of Greg Schluter, whom I haven't spoken to probably in 30 years. Uh, he was uh, just around the corner on another wing, but the same floor uh, in our dorm at Oral Roberts University. And I would see Greg Schluter all over campus reading his Bible. <clears throat> and uh, I would watch him. He'd, he'd just be sitting there reading, reading. Next day I saw him somewhere else reading his Bible. Next day reading the Bible. I was like, what is up with this guy? And what's so exciting that he's always reading his Bible? <clears throat> you know, I... We grew up loving the Lord since we got saved at seven, but I didn't, I didn't know, I didn't understand that you were supposed to read your Bible and study your Bible. I didn't know all the great stuff that was in there. We just were never told those things. So to see somebody reading their Bible every day was like, what's going on? And it really made me hungry to read the Bible. I thought, I got to find out what's so good in that book. And uh, so... As I got to know Greg, I noticed that his Bible was a Dakes, uh, Dakes Bible. Anybody ever had a Dakes Bible? Well, I thought it said Dakes Anointed Bible. So I was like, Doc, God, I need to get me one of them anointed Bibles. That's what I need, an anointed Bible. So I went and bought me a Dakes <laughs> Annotated Bible. I was like, oh, I thought this thing was anointed. It's annotated. Well, Whatever. <laughs> so that got me on my journey of reading and studying the Bible. So you never know, you know, carry your Bibles to the house of God, carry your Bibles with different places, and you might make somebody else hungry for the Word. Oh, thanks for that overwhelming response. Yeah, okay, well, on you, okay. So <laughs> let's pray. Let's get to the Word. Father, thank you for the Word Thank you for the word you have for us today, the written, the, the spoken, the logos, the rhema. Lord, we just receive whatever you have for us in Jesus' mighty name. And everybody said, amen. amen. All right, as you know, a few weeks back we began a series of messages entitled God's Three Kinds of Angels. And, of course, we found out that God has created angels. He created a lot of angels, 100 million plus angels. Obviously, he likes angels. Uh, he created three kinds of angels, worshiping angels, warring angels, and working angels. And then e in each of those categories, he created an archangel, a leader angel, head angel of each of those categories. And so we saw that Lucifer was created as the head worship angel. Of course, he got booted out of heaven for his rebellion. Uh, then last week, we looked at uh, Michael, the the archangel of war, the warring angel, and, when, and you, when you read about war in the Bible, uh, you read about Michael, and then today we're going to take a look at Gabriel, what we can learn from the archangel Gabriel, and Gabriel is the archangel of the working angels, okay? So, uh, Daniel chapter 8, uh, you can read it later, verses 1 to 14, uh, tells us about Daniel's vision from God, God is speaking to Daniel throughout the book on, about visions and dreams and things about the end times. And, and we pick up in verse 15 with this. Then it happened when I, Daniel, had seen the vision and was seeking the meaning that suddenly there stood before me one having the appearance of a man. All right, now, first of all, notice Daniel's referring to his visions. And notice what Daniel did when he had these visions. He went to seeking the Lord. Now, the Lord is a very interesting person. The Lord likes enigma. He likes rhymes. He likes hidden things. And so when God speaks to us in dreams and visions and other ways, He often does so in figurative figures or speeches. All right? So in dreams and visions, often... 
the symbolism of the things in the dream have to be understood in light of a different meaning. It's not always just what you see as literal meaning. Like he, in, in this vision, he saw a ram and a goat. Well, the ram and the goat represented nations, okay? M much like, you know, the United States of America. We have a, an emblem that represents us. It's not an animal. It's a man, Uncle Sam, right? Okay. Uh, but throughout the Bible, God uses these different uh, animal figures. I don't know about you. I grew up a uh, Owatonna Indian. Owatonna Indian. Come on. Of course, they changed that to the Huskies. I don't know how that went for the girls. You know, who wants to be a Husky girl? But anyway, right? So <laughs> I still kind of refuse to go, <laughs> go that path. I'm, I'm an old town Indian, and I'm going to, you know, we are the Indians, mighty, mighty Indians. Okay, you guys get the idea. <laughs> okay, so there, you have to have an interpretation. Well, God isn't trying to hide something from us. He's hiding something for us. So what do we have to do when he does speak into our life through figurative language, through, whether it's dreams, visions, prophetic words, or whatever? Well, what we have to do is we have to seek the Lord. And this is what Daniel did. Is he went to the Lord to seek the meaning of these visions. Okay? And then what happens? Well, Gabriel shows up. Why does Gabriel show up? Because Gabriel is a working angel. His main function that we see in the scriptures is to deliver messages from God to God's people. Thank you, Jesus. Now think about this. We don't know this for sure. We've talked about it. But we know for sure God created 100 million angels. But we don't know that he created one-third worshiping, one-third warring, and one-third Working, But let's just say he did for a moment. Uh, then we would have 33 and a third million messenger angels. We have 33 and a third million angels whose job it is to deliver messages to God's people. So now it becomes much more feasible, doesn't it? Because you know, think about it. How many people are there on planet Earth right now? Well, there are over 6 billion people. Okay, well, now we understand why God needed 33 million messenger angels because God wants to talk to his people. And God does talk to his people. Now you say, well, I've never seen an angel. Well, you, you, that doesn't mean you haven't experienced angelic ministry. It really doesn't. We'll talk more about that. So uh, Gabriel shows up, and he, he appears as a man. Now, angels can look like human beings. <clears throat> Sometimes they look like beings with wings, two wings, four wings, six wings, seraphim, cherubim, anyway, that's a whole other series. Uh, but <clears throat> they can appear just as a, a human being. Write these two verses down. Would you run me a cough drop, honey? <clears throat> I left a, a fan and air conditioning on this week, and I have a self-induced cold. How weird is that? It's like, oh yeah, I did that before, but I forgot, you know. You ever done something years ago, and you forget, and you do it again, you're like, duh, you dummy. Okay. Hebrews 13, 2. Now watch this. <clears throat> Be not forgetful to entertain strangers, for by, thereby some have entertained angels unaware. How do you entertain an angel unaware? Well, because it looks like a human being. Now, obviously, you got to be careful who you entertain. <clears throat> but, you know, one of the Christian characteristics that the scriptures teach us is that as Christians, we should be hospitable. We should be hospitable to people. All right? And in, in doing so, you may entertain an angel without even realizing it. You may have already entertained an angel without realizing it. I, this morning I didn't share angel stories. And she was like, you got to share some of our angel stories. I was like, I know, but I only got so much time too. So I am probably going to tell you one in a little bit. All right, so Gabriel was on an assignment to Daniel. Now, write this verse down, Hebrews 1.14. Hebrews 1.14 says, are they not all 
they, the angels, are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for those who are heirs of salvation? Now, do we have any heirs of salvation here this morning? Say, that's me. Yeah, that's us. If you've been born again, you've been saved, you have angels that are assigned to minister to you. Yeah. Now you're saying, boy, I'm just having a little hard time believing that right now. Well, that's one of the reasons we're preaching on this, so you don't have a hard time. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word because God uses angels to minister to his people. And you're going to see today how to cooperate with God and his angels to get them out working on your behalf. Oh, thank you, Lord. Okay, so angels are assigned by God to minister to God's people. All right, go to chapter 9 and verse 21. Now, there are a lot of things in there, but uh, we're going to go to verse 21. Daniel says, yes, while I was speaking in prayer, the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, which we just read about, being caused to fly swiftly, reached about the time of the evening offering. All right, now, angels can fly. I don't think that's a surprise to any of us, but, uh, man, they can, they can cruise, right? Pretty cool. Now, notice he says, at the beginning of your supplications, this is verse 22, watch this, at, uh, da, 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 da. where am I? Um, sorry? So, do, do, do. Verse 23, at the beginning of your supplications, the command went out. You get that, verse 23? The command went out. Are we up, are we up on the screen? Yeah. The command went out, and I have come to tell you, for you are greatly beloved. Therefore, consider the matter and understand the vision. Okay, what did Gabriel say? When you prayed, the command went out. Whose command? God's command. When, God, when Daniel prayed, God heard him, and God commanded Gabriel to go bring him understanding of the vision. Now listen, I, I know, sometimes it feels like it takes God a long time to answer prayer. But listen, God wants to answer us speedily. This summer, Lord willing, it's been concerning me a little bit, so I, I'm thinking that we may end up going this direction. I'm going to teach a series on the teachings of Jesus. Doesn't that sound good? Woo! And we're going to cover every red letter in the New Testament. Amen. Well, one of Jesus' teachings is about prayer. And it's about the unrighteous judge. Anyway, the point of the whole story, which pe it's funny how we get things mixed up. The way some people end up, you know, actually concluding almost the opposite. The whole point of the story is God wants to answer your prayer and he wants to answer it speedily. <laughs> Amen. So, but there are other factors that are involved with that, such as here. We saw this last week when, when Daniel prayed, God gave the command, but it took 21 days for Gabriel to get to Daniel because of the spiritual warfare. Come on, are you out there? Because there's spiritual warfare taking place in the heavenlies. All right. So, God wants to answer our prayers. He wants to answer them speedily. Now, notice it says that when the commandment went forth, Gabriel went to bring the message. All right, write down Psalm 103 and 20. Psalm 103, 20. Now, watch this. It says, Bless the Lord, you his angels, who excel in strength. The angels are like, wow, powerful. I mean, they have excessive strength. Okay? And we won't go into all that today. Who do his word, who do God's word, when God speaks, they do it. Now watch this. Heeding the voice of his word. Heeding the voice of his word. Now, we have the word of God called the Logos, or what we refer to as the Bible. 
The Bible is God's word. Now listen to this. You're going to learn something. When we give voice to the word of God, the angels go forth to bring it to pass. They hearken to the voice of God's word. So as our ministering spirits, when we speak the word, the angels hearken to that word and go forth to bring to pass as ministry to us what we are speaking. Thank you, Lord. Now I tell you, you can accuse me all day of being word of faith and I'll say amen. All your part of that, confess it and name it and claim it and blab it and grab it and yes I am and yes I am and amen. <laughs> Why? Because this is the teaching of God's word. Our words are creative. Our words are very powerful over our life. In fact, listen to this. James chapter 3. James, James is uh, the brother of Jesus. And here's what he had to say about the power of words. He said that words, the words of our mouth are like three things. He gives three examples. Number one, it's like a bit in a horse's mouth. Number two, it's like the rudder of a ship. And number three, it's like a match that starts a forest fire. All right, now think about this. One day we're all going to come back riding on white horses. I, I hope I get a little one because I don't want a big one. I've been thinking I need to practice up here a little bit because I'm not exactly fond of these creatures. But anyway, you know, for some, you're going to have a grand old time. You, how many women here love riding horses? Oh, yeah, yeah. See, I don't know. What is it about girls and horses? We're, just something, something. Okay. So you can have my big horse, I'll take your little horse. All right, so Jesus said, or James said, that our words control our life like a bit controls the horse. The bit is like our words. And what does a bit do? Well, watch this. A bit puts pressure on the tongue of the horse. And when you learn to put pressure on your tongue to not say what you don't want, but speak what you do want, now you're going to bring your life into line with the angels hearkening to the God's word, the voice of his word, and going forth to minister to bring to pass for you what you want and not what you don't want. Second example, the rudder on a ship. You ever been on a ship? Anybody ever been on a cruise? Come on, great stuff, right? Okay, that huge ship, James says, is guided by a little rudder. Little rudder. Or any boat, the little turning of the, the little part in the back. Rudder. He said, that's, that's what words are to your life, he said. The words you speak direct your whole life. They turn you the direction you're speaking. And the third one, he says, words are like like a match that starts a forest fire. And, I, and, and our, my day as a kid, come on, so who, who else will own up to this? We used to watch the commercials about Smokey Bear. Yeah, I know the kids are like, Smokey Bear? Who's Smokey Bear? Smokey Bear, only you can prevent forest fires. And what would, what would they show? Somebody throwing a match out the window and bam. Well, we see that in California all the time. Somebody gets access, you know, gets, uh, what's the word, gets flippant and starts a whole forest fire with just a little fire. He said, James said this, he said, your life is the result of your tongue and the things you use it to speak just like forest fire, fires are the result of a little fire. So, oh, it's just, that can't be possible. How could just what you say be that important? Well, it is. It's that important. In fact, James concludes by saying this. He said the whole course of physical effects in your life, in other words, the circumstances of your life are set up by the power of your words. Wow! 
That's why years and years and years ago, we quit saying things like things just don't ever work out for us. We started saying everything works out for us. Everything we do, everything we touch turns to gold. Rather than everything we touch fails. Things like that. We, we, we changed that. We changed it. Why? Because we knew that our tongue was creating the circumstances of our life. So why would you say what you don't want when you can have what you do want when you speak those things? Amen. Okay, so this is what James says. Okay, so now let's go to Luke chapter 1. And let's take a look at Gabriel in the New Testament. And uh, there's only two, two usages of Gabriel that are named. I'm going to show you a third one I, I believe is Gabriel, and you'll see why. Uh, but Luke chapter 1 is the story of Zacchaeus. I'm not Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus was the wee little man. Uh, Zachariah. Zachariah. Okay. Zachariah, who was a priest, who was the father of John the Baptist. Okay. And uh, when we went to Israel, not this trip, but the last trip, uh, they, they showed us a tree and said, this is the tree that Zacchaeus climbed up in. Well, I don't know. It's a little hard to believe sometimes, but maybe it was. Who knows? But whatever. At least the story is still alive. Amen. So here's Zechariah, and he's in the temple, and watch what happens. Let's, let's start here in oh, verse 11. Then an angel of the Lord, we're going to see later that it's Gabriel, appeared to him standing on the right side of the altar of incense. All right, verse, 11, or verse 12. And when Zacharias saw him, he was troubled and fear fell upon him. Now think about this. How would you respond if an angel appeared to you? I don't know that we really know until it actually happens, but, you know, through this series, you can be prepared. Be prepared so that you're not totally shocked. Wouldn't it be fun to say, hey, I've been expecting you. <laughs> Shock him. Hallelujah. You have? Yeah, pastor told me you were going to come see me one of these days. Okay. Verse 12, and when Zechariah saw, oh, verse 13, but the angel said to him. Now, see, here's where people start freaking out. But listen, this is Bible. Is this the Bible? Angels can talk to us. In fact, I'm convinced angels do talk to us. Now, you know, I never heard an angel. Well, you don't know that you never heard an angel. And here's, here's why. I remember Brother Hagen years ago when I was attending Bible college. Uh, he said he, he had a vision from the Lord. And in the vision, uh, this relative of his just had the hardest time serving God. He just couldn't seem to stay on track. And the Lord showed him a demon that sat on his shoulder and would whisper in his ear. The band didn't know it was a demon whispering in his ear, but the demon would whisper in his ear and then he would act as if it was his own thought or idea. Well, Think about that. If that's true, I would guess God sends angels to people to whisper things in our ears. And we sometimes think, oh, I just had a great idea. No, you didn't just have a great idea. An angel just spoke that to you. You see, so there's a good possibility you've had angels speak to you. You just haven't seen that yet. Very good possibility. We'll talk more about that. And you'll see that. So the angel said to him, now, what, what did the angel say? All right. Do not be afraid, Zacharias, because usually people were afraid when angels showed up. For your prayer is heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John. Okay, so I think everybody's on track here now. We're talking about the birth of John the Baptist. And you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth. For he will be great in the sight of the Lord, and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink, he will also be filled with the Holy Spirit even from his mother's womb. And he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. Take note. He will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. Well, that means they weren't serving the Lord. You know, there's a bunch of people amongst God's people that aren't God's people. Come on. 
fact, a few years ago, you guys know the name John Bevere, one of our uh, charismatic teachers, the Lord spoke to him, and he said, I want you for the next couple of years to just go to, just to the charismatic churches that I send you to. And he said, I'm sending you there because there's a whole bunch of people sitting in the pews that aren't saved, that need to get saved. Come on. How many of you know not everybody that goes to church is saved? And not even in churches that, okay. Many of us come from churches, it's very difficult to get saved because the message just isn't there hardly. It's like you got to be a private eye detector to, you know, spy, uh, a spy to find salvation. That's what we, in our lives, that's how it was. And even after we got saved, the Lord had to give my mom a dream and just show her the whole church and everybody's fellowshipping and having fun and nobody was talking about Jesus. Why? Because we weren't taught to find Jesus. We are just, you know, a religious organization. So, you know, even in churches that do preach salvation and how to receive the forgiveness of your sins from God through Jesus Christ, we have people sitting that have never personally given their life to Jesus Christ, never submitted to the lordship of Jesus and been born again. So if you're sitting here today and, and you're not born again, you're just, you're like, you're here, but you haven't had that personal submission to the lordship of Jesus and received the washing away of your sins, man, today's a great day to do that. And you do it any time, just call out to the Lord. I'm a sinner, Lord, and I need your salvation, and I'm ready to submit. See, that's usually, that's the breaking point. That's the, that's the, the turner right there is, am I willing to submit or not? If not, the Lord goes, oh, get, get back to me when you're ready. Come on, anybody out there? Okay. All right, let's see. Verse 17, he will also go before him, John will go before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the, and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. So John was called to prepare people for Jesus' coming, his first coming. Okay? Verse 18, and Zacharias said to the angel, did you get it? Zacharias said to the angel, it's okay to talk to angels. In fact, you know, <laughs> in the Bible, often when an angel appeared, people were so shocked they didn't say anything. Well, you know what? That's just down plain rude. You ever said something to somebody and they don't say anything back? It's rude. My world, that's rude. It's like, say something. I, I just said something to you, say something back. Right? Okay. Well, anyway, the angel answered and said to him, whoops, uh, 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 Zechariah said to the angel, verse 18, sorry, how shall I know this? For I'm an old man and my wife is well advanced in years. He's like, really? I don't know, you know, I'm kind of too old for this. Anybody relate to that one? Thank God the young people are having the babies. Don't, don't need another round of that. Right, right. Well, now watch the angel's response. What, what, what does the angel say? The angel answered and said to him, I am Gabriel, watch this, who stands in the presence of God. Nice. <clears throat> What's he doing standing in the presence of God? He's waiting for his commands. Waiting for his assignment. And was sent to speak to you. What was he sent to do? To speak to him. God sends angels to speak to us. And bring you these glad things. Bring us good news. Come on. Angels, you are welcome. To bring good news. Amen. Okay, next verse, verse 20. But behold, you will be mute and not able to speak until the day these things take place. 
Why? Because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their own time. Okay? He was struck mute because he didn't believe. But why did he have to be struck mute because he didn't believe? Come on. Are you putting it together? Listen, if you understand the teaching of God's word and the power of words, what Gabriel was saying is, Zacharias, you are going to be mute because God doesn't want you messing up his plans with your son John. So just in case... You're going to be unable to talk until the day he's born because God has a plan for your son. Now, what do we learn from that? I'll tell you what we learn from it. It's pretty simple, and that is angels hearken to the voice of his word, and our words create the circumstances of our life, so you're better off not talking if you can't talk right. If you don't like what you've got, quit saying what you've been saying and start talking a new talk. Come on, start talking what you want. I mean, how many things do you hear God's people saying that you're like, I wouldn't say that. I wouldn't say that. I wouldn't say that either. Well, things just don't work out well for the Johnsons. Well, I think the Johnsons need to change what they're saying. <laughs> right? Amen. What, what, what do you want? Say what you want. Start saying what you want. Now, I know we've been, we've been there. We've been, you know, it's been a long time, but we've been there. And the people are, well, wouldn't that be lying? Well, I don't know. You say all kinds of negative things that seem to be lies. I mean, they, in the sense that they don't exist now, and you're calling them into your life, something bad. No, it's not lying. What is it? It's speaking God's word. It's speaking truth. It's learning to prophesy. It's learning to use your words to create the life God wants for you. Amen. Life's just catching up to your words. Amen. Oh, thank you, Lord. So, Here's John. What a, what a story. So John can't speak. Now think about this. So if you, you go on and read the rest, he's, he's, he, when his job's done, he's got to go outside. There's all kinds of people waiting. And, okay, you know how you can see stuff on people? Okay? John comes out of the temple. Let me tell you, they're all like, what happened to you, John? Oh, Zacharias, thank you. What happened to you, Zacharias? Well, guess what? He can't talk. And then you got to go home to your wife and not say anything. Oh, that's going to go over big. <laughs> oh, how was work today, honey? Anything happened? <laughs> right? Wow. <clears throat> okay. First Thessalonians 4, we'll wrap up. You know what? what go to First Thessalonians 4. But guys, you know what? I need, I need a, another, I need Psalm 91 real quick. Can you do that real quick? I, I apologize to our guys in the back. I, I got to go to Psalm, go to Psalm 91. You guys, if you have your Bible, do Psalm 91. Now watch this. Watch this. So good. So good. Okay, here's your assignment. I'm not kidding you. I'm giving you an assignment. You have an assignment today from your pastor. Sometime today, it only takes you five minutes probably, maybe less. I want you to go read Psalm 91. Psalm 91. That's your assignment. Okay? I'm going to read to you a few verses from Psalm 91. It's the divine protection chapter. Verse 11. 
It says, for he shall give his angels charge over you. Way to go, guys. <clears throat> God will give his angels charge over you to keep you, protect you in all your ways. So you know what we say? We say, thank you, Lord, that you give your angels charge over the Petersons. And they protect us in all our ways. Thank you for the divine protection. God told Abram, I will be your shield and your exceedingly great reward. Well, what's a shield? That's divine protection. Your, uh, your shield and your exceedingly great reward, if you study that out, it actually says ever-increasing source of income. That's what it says. I was like, well, why would I need it today? We always increasing. Because there's a lost world that needs to hear the gospel, and it's not just about you. <laughs> there are orphaned children all over the earth that don't even get a meal today because God's people don't bring their tithe to the house of God. That's why you need to keep making more and more money. So you can bring your pastor more money. So I can send it to our apostles. Send them more and more money to build orphanages and churches and Bible schools. Amen. That's good preaching. Hey, Amen, Mike. Good preaching right there. Okay, so, you know, as you speak God's word, you're using your words to create your life. Say, Father, thank you that you are our shield. You're our divine protection. I thank you that the angels of the Lord are encamped around about us. And that you are our ever-increasing source of income. Yes, I need more. Because I'm a giver. I'm a great commission person. Amen. Amen. Don't ever get satisfied. Amen. I mean, always be satisfied, but don't be get satisfied. All right. Oh, I didn't read the rest of that. What's the next verse? Come on, verse 12. In their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against the stone. Verse 13. You shall tread upon the lion and the cobra, figurative. The young lion and the serpent you shall trample under foot. Where does the devil belong? Under your feet. Devil, get under my feet. And that's all I've got to say to you. Amen. All right, First Thessalonians 4. Okay, let's, let's, here's the dessert. You ready for your dessert? Okay, you just had the meal. Here's the dessert. First Thessalonians 4. I'll just read it up there. Here we go. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout. This is the appearing of the Lord. This is when the Lord comes in the clouds to receive the church unto himself, take us back to heaven for the judgment seat of Christ, the marriage supper of the Lamb, before we come back seven years later at the second advent when the Lord uh, comes to Jerusalem. Okay? Wow. Parenthetically, if anybody's interested, see me after the service. But listen, somebody, uh, I can't even remember. I have to look at my, my text. But somebody shot me a picture of this coin that was made in Israel. So I, as soon as I saw it, I was like, I'm getting me one of them. So I ordered one of those and got it this week. And it's a, it's a half shekel that was made, they're making them in Israel. And on the front of this half shekel, listen to this is Cyrus, two images, Cyrus, King Cyrus, and next to him is the image of President Trump. I'm not kidding you. I, I'm not kidding you. Now listen, this. Israel printed these coins in honor of President Trump and to say the anointing that was on King Cyrus that delivered us from Babylon 
and set us back to our own country is now upon the President of the United States, Donald Trump. Now, and on the back of the coin, listen to this. I'm telling you, listen to this. This is, this is amazing. On the back of the coin, you want to, people always, you know, periodically, people say, when do you think the Lord's coming? I just tell them, when we get our act together, okay? <laughs> when we get the job done. On the back of the coin is the third temple. And Israel is now asking President Trump to help build the third temple. Now, I don't know how that can happen in light of, in case you don't know, the Temple Mount right now has a mosque sitting on it. Dome of the Rock. Is that right? Sometimes I call it the Rock of the Dome. <laughs> dome of the Rock, it's a mosque. Well, now, Christians and, you know, whomever can go to the Temple Mount, of course, Christians still can't go into the mosque. But if Israel were to begin building the temple, something would have to happen to the mosque, which would create World War III, But I'm just telling you, keep your eye on the temple. <laughs> okay, so if you want to see that coin, I'll be glad to show it to you afterwards. I'm so excited about it. It's so fun. In fact, what it is, it, a half shekel, uh, you study the scriptures, it was the coin that everybody, everybody in Israel, 20 years old and above, every uh one had to bring a half shekel. It was called the temple tax. Now that was, besides tithes and offerings, it was a temple tax that they brought, I believe it was annually, once a year, uh, to the temple. Come on, are you out there? Anyway, okay, so the Lord's going to come. Back up there, guys, if you would, please. He's going to be shouting, right? What comes next? We have some more there. Ready? Okay. Now watch this next phrase. With the voice of what? An archangel. Now there's only three archangels. We know it's not Lucifer because he got kicked out of heaven. He's not on the same team anymore. So it's not him. It's probably not Michael because the Lord's not coming back to do war. He's coming back to receive the church. So it's got to be who? Gabriel. And what is Gabriel's job? He brings messages. Now, watch this. He says, with the voice of an archangel, what's the voice saying? What's, what's the archangel saying? And with the trump of God. I don't know. Here's what I kind of imagine. <coughs> I imagine Gabriel doing something like this. Do, 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 do. And now, the Lord Jesus Christ appearing. Or something like that. <coughs> Amen? And there he is, and we take off. The dead of Christ rise first. We catch up with him. And we meet the Lord, and we go back to heaven and go get our rewards, get all dolled up, go to the marriage supper, marriage of the Lamb, and the marriage supper of the Lamb. And then we grab a white horse and come back for the second advent. And we get stationed around the world as to where we're going to rule and reign. Depending on what you did here, now. Yeah, depending on what you do here, now. This is what is going to determine your position in the millennium. Some are going to get to rule over nations or cities or villages or whatever. Come on. See, I think about that. People don't think about that stuff, but it's, 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 it's all real. This is real stuff. Okay, so what do we learn from Gabriel? Number one, that God's working angels are assigned to work on behalf of God's people, you and I. Amen. 
And we need to be expecting that. Number two, these working angels go to work on our behalf when we give voice to the word. See why we're speaking the word? We keep speaking the word. Why? Because the angels are waiting for the word. Matter of fact, I'm going to tell you one story. Shree, I, I actually haven't seen angels. I've felt the presence of angels, but I haven't seen angels. But Sheree's got to see a lot of angels. Uh, and I, I don't know, I don't see how that's fair at all, really. I see, I've seen a lot of demons, and I was like, Lord, I've seen enough demons. Could I see a few angels now? Right? I, I, I could tell you a demon story that is, I mean, you'd be, you'd be so scared you'd call for an Uber to take you home today. <laughs> but uh, uh, one night, this is when we lived in Owatonna, and uh, I can't remember the story. Come up and help me with the story, Shree. Come help me really quick. It was night. We were sleeping, and, it, and I'm missing something. Tell me, t- help me out. So I was awakened to, Mom, Mom, come here. I need you. Mom, come here. No, I'm sorry. That's what I'm normally used to. This time, it was Dad. <laughs> That's right. That's what made it so different. It was Dad. Dad, I need you. And I woke up thinking, Dad? Who's calling for Dad in the middle of the night? Moms, can you relate? Yeah, yeah. So anyway, I went upstairs, and all the kids were fine. Everybody was sound asleep. Went back downstairs to bed. And I, again, Dad, we need you. We need you to come now. Got up, went back upstairs. All four kids were sound asleep. Everybody was great. Went back downstairs, and I heard it again. I sat up, and next to Tim, we had a blue leather chair. And there was a man sitting there, but it was an angel sitting exactly like Mike is sitting right now, actually. <laughs> and except for he was sitting up, can you, he was sitting up a little bit further on the chair. <laughs> <laughs> he was looking at Pastor Tim, and, and I knew it was an angel. And I said, hello. I said, what's your name? And he said, my name is Cyrus. And it's, you know, there's, it's makes sense to me that Cyrus, our grandson, is named Cyrus because our kids have heard about Cyrus forever and the, how powerful he is. Did you know I'm going to have a granddaughter real soon here, too? Okay, so anyway, the dream. So, so I just said, you know, hello and welcome. And I said, what, what do you, what, what can I help you with? What are you doing? And I looked out, and Tim had just built a thousand square foot new bedroom. It was a two story, beautiful room, and it was solid glass. Now, in the natural realm, all the blinds were pulled, but in the spiritual realm, you could see through them. And so I'm seeing all outside and shoulder to shoulder were, was this row of strong men all in military attire and then a huge army behind them. I forgot about this, yeah. And so they were just, you know, shoulder to shoulder. And I said, you know, I looked at the angel and I said, what's going on? And, I, and the Lord said, the angel Cyrus is waiting for Tim to give the orders to him so he can tell the military, tell the soldiers where to go. Well, Tim was just planning a trip to Honduras. So I knew that he needed to send them to out to Honduras to the villages to bring them to the crusade when they were ready for the crusade. And this was also a really fun thing, just a little side note. Our neighbors were really curious about us, our brand new next door neighbors. And I had witnessed to them. They came that Sunday and I never saw them again. <laughs> I'm sure they went out to the backyard to check to see if the angels were still there or something. But well, angels are yeah, real. You got to say that, so that Sunday, we were sharing about that dream that night and the angels. And, of course, you know, I always think, why, why do the visitors always come when we share stuff like this, you know? Because everybody's hungry for the spiritual realm in their life. Amen? It's more real than the natural realm. You know what? And that, and that morning we called out. The men were doing a missions trip to Honduras. And I think there were 22 or 23, 22, whatever, men. And so they all came up front. And the power of God was so strong uh, that morning that all of a sudden, just one by one, they started falling out. Bam, 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 bam. And I'm sitting there thinking, Lord, I don't, I don't understand you. You know, we don't have this happen every Sunday. And the Sunday you do this, you bring our neighbors. 
But, well, you know, it's, it's his church, so he can do whatever he wants to do. But you see that? Cyrus was waiting for his commands. And let me tell you something about Honduras. I'll, I'll tell you what. Uh, right now, just, just got word this week, we financed a, a mission trip for Rafael and a few of our, our men to go down into Nicaragua. And uh, we got pictures yesterday of them on, on radio, and they've had meetings and have met several men who are church planters that want to come into our network of churches and begin planting CFC churches, preaching the message of kings and priests throughout Nicaragua. So I need, we need your prayers on that, because uh, we could have an explosion in Nicaragua. And, uh, oh, what was it about Honduras? Dear Lord, help me. Oh, shoot. Oh, uh, <clears throat> Pastor Ovidio, who was an evangelist for the Church of God of Prophecy years ago when I went down and was, was teaching conferences. He ended up in the conference, and he was like the, the top evangelist <clears throat> for the Church of God of Prophecy in, in all of Honduras. And uh, God used me to prophetically speak into his life that he was to start a church in this t certain town. He started a church in that town. They outgrew their facility and have, have uh, rebuilt a, a facility in that town. And God spoke, said that he was to go to the next town up, start another church. And we just got pictures of a 500-seat sanctuary that's almost finished that they started in that town that's already full. And they're just wrapping up building that. So let me, let me just ask you to be praying this week. As you think about it, next few weeks, whatever, be praying for the work in Honduras and Central America because God's moving. God's moving in a powerful way. So praise the Lord. Anyway, we need to roll. Uh, Trey. Trey.